name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on OCRA transition elements and qualitative analysis. So this video is going to look specifically at OCR, um, the OCR side for transition elements. It is tailored to this specific exam board. So everything in here is everything you need to know and nothing more. Um, the video is designed for revision and there was a wide range of different videos for OCRA um, covering all of year one and year two as well. Um, so if you have a look on uh, Allery Chemistry on my YouTube channel, uh, and it has loads more videos on there. They're all for free and all I ask is that you just click the subscribe button uh, just to show your support so it keeps all that, uh, it keeps all that free. Um, you can have a, a private copy of any of the slides that are shown here. Um, if you click on the link in the uh, description box, you can purchase them from um, my test shop. Um, they're really good value. There's loads of information as you'll, as you'll see, and it means you can scroll through them as and when you require, um, either on your tablet or on your smartphone, and it means you have all the information you require for OCR. Um, the questions, I mean, everything, sorry, not the questions, everything on here um, is, is uh, revision purposes. It is very important that you do practice with questions. Um, so that's exam technique. Obviously, all the content on here um, or knowing the content is one thing, but actually practicing it is another. Um, it's a bit like learning to drive. So if you get a you can read the highway code and use the highway code to help you to learn to drive, but that doesn't mean you can hop in the car and actually drive. So it's very important that you actually practice all of your questions and use your um use your exam technique skills and improve them but there is videos on allery chemistry that look into past paper questions and exam techniques so please go and have a look on there okay so like i say um this video is related to the specification and it meets all the specification points so this is just um the the information that you need from the specification for ocr for this topic and that bit as well so there's quite a bit in this video but there's quite a lot to get through Okay, so let's start with D block elements first. So what we need to know is where the D block elements are in the first place. So this is a copy of the periodic table, um, obviously down there, and you've all seen the periodic table by now, you should have been able to. The D block element is the block in the middle there. So it's right in the middle of the periodic table. Um, and some of these elements are transition elements. So not all of them, they're all D block elements, but not all of them are transition elements. And the ones that you um, need to know are the ones in the top row of this block. And you'll see we're going to mainly use them ones um, throughout the video. You will occasionally see some of the other ones, but the ones that you'll see more often are the top row ones. Okay, so let's look at electron configuration. And this goes back to year one chemistry when you looked at electron configuration of standard atoms. Um, and not transit. You might have seen some transition elements, but um, this is particularly going to look at that. So if you're not sure on, on transition, on um, electron configuration, then have a look at that video and the year one playlist. So transition element is a D block element and it can form at least one stable iron with a partially filled or incomplete D subshell. So D subshells can hold up to 10 electrons maximum um, and for and for period four D block elements, only eight of these are transition elements. So scandium and zinc are not transition elements because they don't form a stable line with a partially filled D subshell. And that's the criteria for a transition element, but we'll see a lot more of this on the next slide. So here are the electric configurations for the eight transition elements in period four. So remember periods go along the, the periodic table and you can, feed them, you can see them fill up singly first um, and then they double up. This is because electrons repel each other. So remember, you can't have, well, you can have, but it's not favorable to have two electrons in the same orbital, and they'll only pair up if they have to, okay? So if all the other orbitals are singly filled, then the rest, um, then the, the, the other electrons will fill up with them. Um, it's a little bit like, I suppose, if you, if you go on a bus, uh, if you get on the bus and you see everybody sitting in a, in a seat, so you, um, they're occupying their own seat. And it isn't until that you don't normally find, well, I don't anyway, you don't normally find that people will sit next to somebody else if there's an empty seat. Um, and they'll only sit next to somebody else if there's no other seats available. So if you see the same as electrons, electrons will only fill up if there's an op if there's a single orbital and they'll only, sorry, they'll only pair up if there's um, all the orbitals are, are full. So let's have a look at these different orbitals. So we're going to look at um, using a um, electron configuration of argon first. So you might see in this where we use 
um, argon or a, a noble gas in a square bracket. Uh, and this noble gas represents a configuration of, in this particular case, it's argon. This represents a configuration of this which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. It just speeds it up, so I don't have to write all that out um, all the time. Okay, so titanium, so the first one. Um, so the outer shells, you have um, two electrons in the 3d orbital, and obviously you've got two in the 4s. Um, vanadium, again, the next electron um, fills up after that. Uh, chromium, we've now got five full, uh, five five electrons in the 3d and only one in the 4s so what happens here is one of the electrons in the 4s orbital jumps down to fill up the 3d orbital so you have a, a full half where well, you've got half uh, filled subshells so the 3d and the 4s so that's what happens with chromium so just be careful with that uh, manganese the electron now goes back into the 4s so the extra, the extra electron for manganese um, for iron, we then start filling up as normal. Now, this is the first time when we start pairing up electrons. So we've paired them up here within iron. Uh, cobalt, um, again, we've added the extra electron into that shell. Uh, nickel, again, so we've now got three paired, uh, paired orbitals. And the final one is copper. Now, notice copper and chromium behave in a similar way. So the electron that was in the 4S for um uh, for nickel has now the extra electron has now actually jumped into the copper uh, 3d orbital so you can see here we've now got a full 3d subshell which is more stable than having um than having an unpaired one in the 3d so now you can see that we've got a 4s um a, a, a one electron in the 4s orbital so yeah so chromium and copper behave differently you've got to be aware of this so and an electron from the 4s orbital moves into the 3d orbital to create a more stable half full or full 3d subshell respectively so just be aware of the electron configurations for chromium and copper because they're slightly different or they deviate away from what you might expect okay so let's look at scandium and zinc so scandium and zinc remember are not transition elements so scandium forms only one stable ion, which is SC3+. Uh, and scandium has an empty D sub subshell. It's not a partially filled D subshell, so it's not a transition element. So if you think about it, scandium has um, three electrons. It loses all three, and it has empty subshells. So it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a, a partially filled D subshell. So there it is there. And there it is, scandium 3 plus. So remember, for it to be a transition element, it must have a partially filled D subshell. And then if we look at zinc, zinc only forms one stable ion, which is zinc 2 plus. So zinc 2 plus is a full D subshell and is not partially filled as it's not a transition element. So you can see here that's zinc, normal, zinc metal, and the iron is that. We always remove from the 4S orbital first before the 3D. Um, that's that's a, a basic rule you've got to remember. So when you remove electrons, you've got to remove from the 4s first, then the 3d. So that's why the 3d orbital is full. Okay, so let's look at some more transition um, metal configurations. So like I say, transition metals lose electrons in a specific way. So if we look at the electron configuration for Fe3+, it loses three electrons two from the 4s and one from the 3d so it goes from here so it's, this is the transition element or tris, uh, the electron configuration for iron which is 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 3d6 and 4s2 but to turn it into an fe3 plus we must remove three electrons from the atom so there we are so that becomes 3p6, 3d5. So we've lost the two electrons, uh, lost the three electrons from the iron atom. So what we've got to make sure is we've got to check to make sure that the numbers add up to um, 23 because we should have 26 electrons in iron. We take three away and that adds up to 23. So we've got to make sure that all the small numbers at the top add up to 23. So we lose from the 4s there we are and then the 3d and then that gives us our new configuration 
So the 4S orbital is lost first, then any from the 3D. So it always goes that way. Okay, so let's have a look at the properties of transition metals. So transition metals have specific properties, which include variable oxidation states, um, they form coloured ions in solution, and they are good catalysts as well. So transition metals have variable oxidation states. This is because the electrons sit in that 4S and 3D energy levels, and these are really close, as you'd seen on the, in, the, in the previous slide. Um, so because they're close, it means the electrons can transition quite readily between the 4S and the 3D orbitals. So as a result, um, electrons are gained and lost using a similar amount of energy. It doesn't, there isn't really much of a differential there. Um, and so um, when they form the ions, um, they f have coloured properties as well. So if we look in the table here, this is just an example of some of the most common ions. You don't need to remember all of them whatsoever, but you will come across them uh, in chemistry. So you'll see you'll have... Um, You'll have your transition elements here. Scandium, remember, isn't a transition element, but the rest are. So these are the most common ions of um, some of the transition metals that, you, um, that you'll come across. So they also form coloured ions in solution, like I say, and we'll have a look at what the colours are of these compounds. And this is the tricky bit. It's very nice, the inorganic chemistry this is, so transition metals. Um, they form really nice colourful compounds, but the problem is it's the, 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 the colours. You have to remember some of the colours of these. So let's have a look. So transition metals have specific properties, and one of them is color, as we said. So vanadium 2 plus forms a violet color. Um, vanadium 3 plus is green. Vanad um, uh, so VO2, so vanadium oxide, is blue, and vanadium dioxide is yellow. So we have Cr3 plus, which is green. Now, what we've got to be careful of is it's violet when it's surrounded by six water molecules, um, and they're just normally um, they're normally substituted so they look green okay so we just got to be careful with that one um, and dichromate is orange mn2 plus is a pale pink color mno42 minus is a green color mno4 minus is purple so that's your um your manganate iron uh, pale green um is fe2 plus and fe3 plus is a is a yellowy color your yellowy brown color Cobalt 2 plus is pink, it's a nice bright pink. Nickel 2 plus is green. Uh, copper 2 plus is a blue color. Um, and titanium 3 plus is purple. And titanium 2 plus is violet. So they're very similar in color. So you need to be familiar with the colors of these substances. So it's going to be quite um, important that you know the colors because you may be expected to, um, um, to know the color changes in some reactions as you'll see later. Okay, so catalysis. So transition metals, remember one of the properties of transition metals is that they are good catalysts. So as transition metals have variable oxidation states, they're made by, they are good catalysts and they receive and lose electrons in the d orbital to help speed up reactions. And so transition metals have surfaces that allow substances to absorb to the surface, which lower the activation energy of a reaction. Now that's vital for a catalyst, um, for it to be used as a catalyst. You must be able to adsorb and desorb from the surface of these um, of these catalysts to be able to um, uh, carry out reactions efficiently. So they're used to make a product faster uh, and can be used to lower the temperature required for a reaction, which is great for industry because it means it's, it's lower cost, it's cheaper. Um, and obviously it's better for the environment because you're not using as much fossil fuels to heat it up as if you didn't use a, a catalyst. But there are risks when using transition metals as catalysts. Um, copper, for example, um, causes long-term long -term exposure can damage the liver. So if we're using copper catalysts a lot, we've got to make sure we're protecting ourselves against the um, negative effects of copper. Um, and you get a ring of eye, uh, you get a ring of copper in the eye, sorry, which shows some, somebody's suffering from copper poisoning and um and we've also got manganese as well um which has a long-term exposure to manganese can cause psychiatric issues and physical tremors as well so manganese is a as a catalyst you've got to protect yourself against that so here's some of the um the effects of uh, copper so for example you can see in the picture of that eye the the ring of uh, copper around the outside of the eye there which is um obviously not very good for you at all if you're uh, if you're exposed if you're exposed to that um, and obviously manganese as well which is just showing you what manganese looks like manganese metal 
Okay, so some examples of reactions that use transition metals and their compounds as catalysts. So, for example, we're going to use um, the, the conversion of hydrogen peroxide to uh, water and oxygen. So this is decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So in this reaction, MnO2 catalyzes hydrogen peroxide decomposition reactions, um, and copper has an oxidation state of plus 4. Um, so it's here manganese, sorry, not copper. Um, and in this reaction, you can see here we've got uh, called the Haber process. So this is the manufacturing of ammonia. So in this reaction, Fe catalyzes the Haber process, making ammonia. And Fe has an oxidation state of zero. Uh, and in this reaction, so this is um, making zinc sulfate. Um, so um, in this reaction, the uh, copper sulfate uh, no, this, would be, this should be zinc sulfate, I apologise for this. So zinc sulfate catalyzes, so you get zinc and acid reactions. Um, and zinc has an oxidation state of plus 2 in this, so that should say zinc, not copper, of course. Okay, so complex iron solution colours. So we form complex ions, uh, form um, complexes in solution. So when we dissolve a uh, transition metal um, substance in water, we get um, we get various different um, colors, uh, and then when we react these aqueous compounds with different substances, we can alter the color. Now you're expected to um, know the color changes and what happens with each of them here. So I'm going to go through the, through them one by one, and you've got to try and remember a lot of these. And you're going to have to try and come up with a method where you can uh, try and remember the colors and the reactions associated with them. One thing I will say, though, is when you dissolve a transition metal iron in water, what happens is um, it reacts with the water, and we have six waters surrounding the metal iron in the middle. Uh, it can be simplified to Mn+. plus. So basically, um, N being the, the charge that was on the metal there. And we'll look at complexes later and their structure, but these are just the reactions of them. So we'll start with, we'll start with copper 2+. plus. So copper 2+. plus when um, it reacts, so this is copper uh, dissolved in water, um, this is the formula of it when it's dissolved in water, so it's CuH2O6, 2 plus, so it always forms 6 around copper, um, or Cu2 plus, and the colour is blue when it's dissolved in water. So iron is Fe2 plus, and that is pale green. Fe3 plus, that's yellow, like a yellowy brown colour, like a rusty colour, which is Fe3 plus. Mn2 plus is pale pink and chromium is green okay so you need to know all these so what we're going to do now is we're then going to actually you with these solutions with this copper two plus solution what happens when we add some hydroxide or oh minus or nh3 to the solution so we're adding a small amount so with copper what happens is we get um a a reaction where we get cuoh2 H2O form. We actually form a precipitate, a pale blue precipitate. So we get a, a, a partial reaction here. We're not completely getting rid of all the ligands. And the next one is FeOH2 H2O4. It's a dirty green precipitate. So again, we've got now changed the ligand. Instead of having six waters around it, we've got two OHs and four waters. Now, this one, which is Fe3, forms three OH and then H2O3 orange precipitate, pink precipitate for manganese, and then a greeny gray precipitate for chromium. Now you'll notice there's a bit of a pattern here. So with two plus ions, you'll see that we have, we always have OH2 and OH2, um, and the charge has actually disappeared. They're now neutral compounds. You see that was a two plus charge. Now this is not, this is a neutral compound. So because it's neutral, it actually precipitates out. And you can see here, that the reason why it's neutral is because water was a neutral ligand, and we'll come into ligands in a moment, um, whereas this isn't. OH has got a minus, so this balances out or counteracts the positive charge on the copper. Whereas if we come to the 3 plus 1 here and here, and that's another 2 plus, 3 plus 1, you can see that we um, have formed 3 OHs instead of the 2 here because this is a 2 plus. Again, it's still a precipitate um, because it's a neutral complex that's formed. Okay, so what happens if we add excess hydroxide to the precipitate? So we form the precipitate, we're now going to add excess hydroxide. Is there any change? Well, with copper, there isn't any change. 
So it's insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide, so therefore there is no change to this. With Fe2+, there is no change, as again, it's insoluble. There is no change for Fe3+, when we add excess hydroxide ions. There's no change for Mn2+, either. But there is a change for Chromium 3+, so it's the only one which actually... Um, all of the water ligands um, disappear and you actually have OH6, you have six hydroxide ligands um, instead. Now this has gone back to a charged substance, so this is 3 minus because we've got six OHs around a plus 3 chromium. So that means we, go, we form a solution again, so this is a dark green solution. So anything that is solid is a precipitate, so anything that is neutral in a complex forms a precipitate. Anything that's not neutral like this is charged forms a solution. Okay, so let's have a look and see what happens when we add excess ammonia to the precipitate. So with copper, um, we get a dark blue solution. We get part ligand substitution with this. So some of the ligands, these are ligands are the, the parts around the central metal ion. And we'll look at these in a moment, exactly what a ligand is. But some of the water molecules actually are displaced, you can see, and the OH. So some of them are displaced for four ammonia ligands and two water ligands we have a charge on there so that means it's dissolved it's in solution so there's no precipitate there is no change for fe2 plus because it's insoluble in excess ammonia there's no change for fe3 plus there's no change for mn2 plus but there is a change for chromium 3 plus because actually what we get is full ligand substitution all of the ligands that were attached to the precipitate here so the oh3 and h2o completely disappear um, well, they're completely removed, and we have six ammonia ligands surrounding it now. Again, it's got a charge, it's 3+, plus, so we form a purple solution. Okay, so let's look at the equations relating to these, because we need to know, or you need to know the equations. Again, it's the same reactions, exactly the same, but we need to know the equations that's associated with it when we add small amounts of OH and NH3 and excess amounts of OH and NH3. So let's start with the first one. So you can see here with copper, I'll quickly go through these because it is just a list of equations, but um, basically we are reacting your copper with six waters with small amount of hydroxide, and that's got to be a two because that equals the number, the charge on there. So we just need enough just to displace it. And we form the complex that we formed there, and obviously the water ligands, um, uh, the water is then um, produced at the end there. And the same with ammonia. So you've got H2O6, 2NH3, that's a small amount, forming obviously a solid complex and ammonium ions at the end. So again, because we only need two of these to turn that 2 plus complex into a neutral one. And you'll see for the 3 plus one in a minute, that will be a 3OH minus and 3NH3. So it is exactly, oops, so we're going this way. I thought it was going to go down here. Um, right, so when we add um, an excess hydroxide or ex excess ammonia to the precipitate, then we know it's insoluble for the first one. Um, but for this one, when we add excess ammonia to uh, copper, um, your copper complex here, then what happens is we form the CuNH3-4 and H2, H2O2-2+. So um, this goes towards there. So you don't need to know the specific equations for that. Okay, so Fe2 plus is exactly the same as copper 2 plus. The reactions are the same, so I'll not go through that in too much detail. And obviously, they're insoluble in both of them, so we don't need to worry about the equations there. Now, you can see here, here's Fe3 plus, and you can see instead of 2OH, we need 3, because that's what's required to turn that into a neutral uh, substance, so that's in a small amount. Um, and obviously, in excess, um, all of them are um, insoluble. And um, for manganese, it's exactly the same as your iron and copper one. And obviously they're insoluble in either of them. And chromium reactions are exactly the same as what they are in Fe3+. Um, but obviously there's a slight difference here. When we add excess hydroxide to, um, to the chromium uh, precipitate here, this complex, it forms CrOH6-3-. And then obviously for your ammonia, um, we form... Um, CrNH36. So basically, with either of these reactions, whether it's excess hydroxide or excess ammonia, we get a complete ligand substitution. 
So there's a lot of equations there. You need to be able to write these equations in the exam. And it's these particular complexes or these particular ions that you expected to write equations for. So you, you do need to remember them, which is a lot, of course. Okay, so let's look at the complexes. Now we've talked about there a little bit about ligands and we've talked about the central metal ion and we've talked about all of that, like the structure of that. What we need to be able to do um, is look at what an actual complex is. How What does it look like with all the bonds? Because one of the properties of transition metals is their ability to form complex ions. So a complex ion is where we have a central metal ion, as we've seen in them tables there, um, surrounded by ligands and it's bonded by dative covalent bonds or coordinate bonds. So you can see here, there's our central metal ion, and L is for ligand, and we have the ligands that are surrounding the metal ion. We have a square bracket here, as you can see, and we have an ion at the top. So this is the, uh, sorry, the ion, this is the charge, whatever the charge is of that metal, and minus the charges that counteract it of the ligands. So the central metal ion, and then obviously we have ligands as well. Now a ligand has a lone pair of electrons um, and them lone pair of electrons are effectively donated into the walls of the metal ion, hence why we form dative covalent or coordinate bonds, which is why they're arrows. So square bracket shows the full complex and the overall charge of the complex obviously sits outside as you can see on there. So complex ions can come in different shapes too. So obviously this is one type of shape. We call this uh, an octahedral shape, but there are other shapes, but we'll see them in a moment. Okay, so let's look at ligands. Um, a ligand is an ion, atom, or molecule that has at least one pair of electrons, and they can be monodentate, bidentate, or polydentate. Okay, so ligands which only have one lone pair of electrons are called monodentate or sometimes known as unidentate ligands. So examples of ligands that you need to know are, these are monodentate ones, are water, ammonia, cyanide, and chloride. Okay, so they're the, they're the monodentate ligands that you need to know, and you've seen some of them in the table already, but this is just going into detail. So ligands which have two pairs of electrons are called bidentate ligands, hence the word bi, so they've got two. So a classic example is ethane diuate, and you need to remember the structures of these ligands. And also ethane 1,2 diamine. So you can see that both have two lone pairs of electrons in each molecule, so they're called bidentate ligands. And ligands which have more than one are just called multidentate ligands. Hence the word multi, meaning lots of. So EDTA, don't worry, you don't need to know the structure of that because it's one big ligand. Uh, EDTA4- is an example of a multidentate ligand and actually it has six lone pairs which it can use to uh, form six coordinate bonds with the uh, central metal ion. So it's a massive ligand. Okay, so let's look at some of the shapes because remember what we said was uh, complexes can form different shapes. So the shape is dependent on the size of the ligands and the coordination number. So the coordination number is the number of coordinate bonds in a complex, not the number of ligands. It's a very common misconception that some people um, think that the uh, coordination number is the number of ligands, it isn't. So it's the number of coordinate bonds. It's a coordination number for coordinate bonds. Okay, so just remember that. So some ligands are fairly small. So what we can do with these is we can fit six of them around a central metal ion. So these are things like water, ammonia, and cyanide ions. So these are very small ligands and you can fit six of them around. So just imagine it, I like to imagine it, a bit like on a farmyard where you have a trough and you have loads of pigs and um, the trough is the central metal ion and it's got the food in and smaller pigs, you can fit lots of small pigs around that trough. So that's like a small ligand. So we can fit six of them around there. Some ligands, though, are larger, and you can only fit four of them around the central metal ion. And chlorine ligand, or the chloride ion, um, is, is a larger ligand. So that's like bigger pigs. You can't fit, uh, you can't fit the same number of um, fatter pigs around the trough. So there's a limited amount of space, and chloride ions are, is an example of a, of a bigger ligand. And bigger ligands still, ethane dioate and ethane 1,2 diamine, these are larger again. And normally, you only have three of these around a central metal ion because they are, they are a lot bigger than chlorine still. So the size of the ligand does have an impact on the 
um, on the number of ligands you can fit around it and obviously the type of complex that could be formed. So complexes with a coordination number of six, so that's six coordinate bonds around the metal ion, form an octahedral shape, as we've, as we've said there. So, for example, water is quite a small ligand, so you can fit six of them around a central metal ion, and so that forms an octahedral shape, as you can see there. It can also be written as coh 6 2 plus. As you've seen in the table, that's normally how we structure it. And then another example is obviously ammonia. Ammonia is a small ligand, just like water, and you can fit six of them around the metal ion, and it can also be written as that. Okay, so all bond angles in an octahedral complex are 90 degrees, um, and that's just the same, and you would have done uh, shapes of molecules in year one as well. So if you're not too familiar with the shapes of molecules, have a look back at the video in the year one playlist, uh, and you can see about the shapes, uh, shapes of molecules here. Okay, so complexes with a coordination number four form tetrahedral and square planar shapes. Okay, so for example, we know that chlorine was one of the bigger ligands and we can only fit four of them around a central metal ion. So here's an example here of copper with four chlorine ligands um, surrounding it. And that's a tetrahedral shape, obviously. So this is written as CuCl42-. Um, the bond angles here are 109.5. Again, that's no different to what you would have seen um, in year one. Um, and then here's another one, which is a square planar example. So still got four ligands around it. You only need to know the specific example of square planar. Um, most of them are tetrahedral. That's the default. Um, there's some. There's only a handful which are square planar. So um, this is an example here, which is platinum with two ammonias and two chlorine uh, ligands coming off it. Um, and this is a specific example that you do need to know. So don't worry too much about wondering whether it should be tetrahedral or square planar. Um, but this one um, is a specific example that you do need to know that is square planar, which is cisplatin, which is an anti-cancer drug. The bond angles in a square planar complex are 90 degrees. And again, you'll know that from, from year one, uh, year one chemistry. So complexes have an overall charge, um, which is the same as its total oxidation state. So the total oxidation state of the metal equals the total oxidation state minus the total oxidation state of the ligand. So this is going back to that table that I was talking about here. It's just going into a little bit more detail here. So you can see here we've got copper with four chlorines around it and a two minus charge overall on the outside. So the overall charge, as we say, is minus two. Um, each Cl minus ligand is minus one. Um, and so there are four of them in total. So that means the total charge for the ligands is minus four. And so the total complex oxidation state is minus two overall. And that is obviously why we've got minus two on the outside of the brackets. So the oxidation state of copper is minus two minus minus four is plus two. So we're using that formula there. So total oxidation state uh, minus the total oxidation state of the ligand. So that's minus two minus minus four is plus two. So that's the oxidation state of copper. Okay, so we're going to look at something called optical isomerism. Now, um, you would have seen uh, optical isomerism um, already, um, which is looking at um, the um, optical activity of a substance. Now, complex ions also show optical isomerism, and this is a type of stereo isomerism. So, complexes are optical isomers um, when they're non superimposable mirror images. Okay, so if you can see here, here's an example of an ion complex, which is here, and you can see that if we put a mirror line down there, then we get its mirror image, which is there. So what that means is because they're optically active, it means they will rotate a plane polarized light. So that's quite important there. Um, now, these are octahedral complexes with three bidentate ligands. So these show optical isomers. Um, and that's very important. You just need to be aware of that. It's not a, it's not a massive area of the specification, but you just need to be aware that they do form optical isomers. Okay, so let's look at another type of isomerism, which is cis-trans isomerism. So complex ions also show cis-trans isomerism, which is another type of stereoisomerism. Um, and it's a branch of EZ isomerism, which you may have heard of. So octahedral complexes with four ligands of the same type and two ligands of a different type display cis 
trans isomerism. Now we've seen some examples already in that table with all the colours, but here's an example here. So you've got four ligands which are the same, which are water ligands, and two which are different, which are chlorine. Uh, we've also got the same um, here as well, which is another cobalt one, which you've got four waters and two chlorines. Now these are isomers of each other, because what we've done is you can see the chlorine positions have changed so they display an EZ, but they can do that because we've got four same ligands and two which are different. So if the two different ligands are opposite each other, so if you look at the one on the left, then we have what we call a trans isomer. It's because they're opposite, hence transatlantic, for example. So they're opposite each other, trans. And then if they are on the, um, if the two different ligands are adjacent to each other, as you can see here, we call that a cis isomer. So you just need to be aware that. Um, of the obviously the structures of them which ones are trans isomers and which ones are cis isomers so square planar complexes also show cis trans isomerism so you can see here so these are square planar complexes with two ligands of the same and two which are different um, these display cis trans isomerism so we've seen this one already um, so this is um, you've got cis platen you've also got trans platen as well so if the two ligands are opposite each other, then you have a trans isomer. So you can see here, there's your two ligands. You've got an NH3 and an NH3, and these are opposite each other, and your chlorines are opposite each other as well. Um, whereas your um, other one is a cis isomer because you've got two chlorines on the same side and two ammonias on the same side. So these are called cis isomers. Okay, so we looked at cisplatin already. We need to know a little bit more information about cisplatin. Um, we know it's an anti-cancer drug already, and it, and it has a square planar complex. Um, so it has that platinum metal in the middle, hence platin, uh, and it has two ammonia ligands and two chloride uh, ligands as well surrounding it. So how it works is it actually binds to the DNA in cancer cells. So cancer is... Um, uh, cancer is basically mutated cells that cluster to form a tumor uh, in the body um, and so what they do what this drug does is it binds onto them cells in in dna and so what happens is the chloride ions in the complex are easily displaced so they can be removed quite easily um, and then what they can do is they can bond to the nitrogen atoms in the dna in the cancerous cell okay so they target the cells in particular and as the complex is attached to the DNA, what this does is it prevents that cell from reproducing, which is, which is basically how a cancer spreads, is it reproduces the cells. And the cell dies and it's unable to repair itself um, or even replicate, of course. But the problem with cisplatin is it does prevent healthy cells from reproducing as well. And obviously this affects cells in the blood, which can suppress the immune system, uh, increase the risk of infection as well. So you're more likely to get kidney disease if you're on these drugs. And also you see some of the side effects of people maybe uh, on chemotherapy um, is maybe hair loss, for example, um, because of the, the obviously the, the, the making of hair cells or cells to make, um, you know, to make new hair um, is obviously dramatically reduced because you're on these drugs. So it's not the, the downside with cancer drugs is they have bad side effects as well. But clearly the, the benefits outweigh the risk because if this is going to, cure a cancer or you know destroy cancerous cells then you know that's got to be better than than not having it of course um so let's look at some of these reactions so we've looked at um obviously anti-cancer drugs cisplatin and we looked at the way in which some of these ligands can drop off and displace so what we need to know is other reactions where we have reactions of transition metals and the loss of ligands. And this fits in with that table that we've seen before as well, showing the colours. This is just explaining some of them reactions. So a colour change can exist when ligands in a complex exchange or substitute. Uh, and these substitution reactions show ligands of a similar size being exchanged in this example. So here we've got cobalt, so COH2O6 2 plus, reacting with... Uh, ammonia here so this is excess ammonia because we've got six here and that forms conh 36 and 6h2o so remember from that from the tables that we would seen before this is just the same reaction that you've seen so it starts off with pink so it's an octahedral shape here and it's pink and here this is octahedral still the same shape remember we're keeping the similar uh the, the shape is the same but the color is different so it's straw colored now and what happens is that both ammonia and water are similar size ligands. So remember from the size of the ligands, they're the same. 
and so um, and have the same charges so the complex shape remains octahedral that doesn't change so what's changing the color here is the type of ligand and nothing else here's another example this is copper so this is copper reacting with ammonia this is excess ammonia so remember from that table um, and what we get here is this um, this shape where we get four ammonias and um, two uh, two water ligands um, so we don't get a full um, ligand substitution here we only get a partial one with, with copper so it's a little bit different but it starts off blue and octahedral and we end up with a darker blue octahedral shape so we still remain octahedral and um, the substitution is partial um, and this reaction occurs when we react it with excess ammonia in this example it's the only one that you need to know for OCR that has a partial substitution so you just need to remember that one Okay, so let's look at these reactions this time. So the similar type of thing, but this time we're going to replace it with ligands of a different size. So all the ones that we'd seen before are ligands of the same size. So for this one, we're going to replace it with different size ligands. So Cl- is a larger ligand, if you can remember that, than H2O and H3. So only four Cl- ion ligands can fit round. So we have to change, um, so we have a change in shape and coordination number. And let's look at some of these examples. So we've got an example here. So this is uh, cobalt H2O6 reacting with um, chloride ions. Uh, this will form COCl4 and 6H2O. So we can only fit four of these chlorines. We could fit six waters around here, but chlorine is much bigger. So we can only fit four around. So it is pink to start off with, and then it goes blue. But notice the shape change. We've gone from octahedral to tetrahedral. Here's another example. So this is copper. Um, again, the same complex um, reacting with, uh, sorry, the same complex, which I mean is, is octahedral. So this that was cobalt. This is copper reacting with the chloride ions to form copper chloride here, copper chloride complex, CuCl4 and 6H2O. Same again, color is blue, it's octahedral. This one's yellow, but it's tetrahedral. So the type of ligand has an impact on the shape. And here's another one. This is an iron one. And again, we have a yellow complex, which is octahedral. And this one's yellow which is um, tetrahedral. So um, it's a different shape again. So you need to be aware of this and you do need to remember these reactions and the colors, the color changes here as well and what's happening to the shape. Okay, so let's look at the, the color of the complex. Um, so we're still focusing on the color, but what it's dependent upon is the size of the energy, the, the change in energy, um, which is delta E. Um, and that's between uh, the energy levels in the electron shells. So this is um, this is affected by the change in oxidation state, the coordination number, and the change of ligand. So here's an example of a ligand substitution where the coordination number is the same, and so is the same shape. So this is one of them that we've looked at already, which is cobalt reacting with six ammonias, and remember it's still remaining octahedral. So it's octahedral before and octahedral afterwards. So there we go. So it's pink, octahedral, straw, octahedral. Okay. So here is an example of ligand substitution where the coordinate, where the coordination number changes, and so does the shape. Now this normally happens when we have a, when a smaller ligand is substituted by a larger one, such as obviously the chloride one as well. So this is shown an example where we have a different, uh, a different shape, a different color, um, and obviously the. Um, the, the impact of the color is either by ligand in the top example here, change in ligand, or by the change in shape, which is down here. And obviously that affects the size of delta E. So let's look at hemoglobin. So heme is an example of a multi-dentate ligand. It's a large ligand, a bit like EDTA, four minus. That was one of the examples of the ligand. So heme is an example. Um, and this is found in the molecule hemoglobin. So it's a big molecule, um, and hemoglobin is a protein. Um, and you, if you do biology, you obviously you'll know this um, because it, it's used to transport oxygen around the body. So the structure is octahedral, and you can see that classic octahedral shape there. So four of the nitrogens, and they're shown um, they're shown by the circle. You can see I've just outlined that there. That comes from the multidentate ligand called heme. Okay, so that's the ligand part. One of the coordinate bonds comes from a large protein called uh, globin. So you can see that circled at the bottom. And the final coordinate bond um, comes from either oxygen or a water molecule. 
Um, and this is quite integral because this is a bit that changes in the body and we'll see how that works. So it's a transport of oxygen, as we've seen. So how does it do that? Well, what happens is your oxygen substitutes the water ligand in the lungs where oxygen concentration is high to form oxyhemoglobin. Okay, and then this is transported around the body. So if you can imagine it, it's in your lungs, it's um, substituted the water uh, and it's replaced it with oxygen and then it will go off into the body and use that for respiration. The water is breathed out. That's why we breathe out water. So the water was attached to one of these molecules. So oxyhemoglobin gives up the oxygen to the place where it's needed. So for example, in the muscle and water takes the place of hemoglobin and it returns back to the lungs to start the process again. Now the water has come from respiration. So one of the products of respiration is water. And so that product is attached onto the globin protein, uh, sorry, onto, the, um, onto hemoglobin. So you can see here, there's your water that's gone back on and that returns to the lungs to get rid of it out through breathing. So we know about um, oxygen and it carries the oxygen around the body and that keeps us alive. But what we also, what you also may be aware of is that carbon monoxide is a poisonous gas. And so what we need to be able to understand is why is carbon monoxide, why is carbon monoxide poisonous? So carbon monoxide is known as the silent killer. Um, you can't smell it, you can't see it. Um, the symptoms are normally you become um, lightheaded, you get headaches, you feel sick, and nauseous. Um, so it's not, and eventually you fall unconscious and you die because you've got a lack of oxygen in, in your blood. So carbon monoxide, if that's inhaled um, in the body, then what happens is the water ligand is replaced with carbon monoxide. So instead of oxygen, it's carbon monoxide. So now you've got hemoglobin rushing around your bloodstream with no oxygen on. I think you can see where this is going now. Now, carbon monoxide bonds very well um, to the iron. So it's got a very strong coordinate bond to the iron and it's not readily replaced by oxygen or water. And so what happens is that means you've got a lower oxygen level um, that you can use in your bloodstream. And this effectively leads to oxygen starvation. Um, and this is why oxygen is poisonous because it's effectively all it's doing. Carbon monoxide is just blocking oxygen from getting around your blood and into the muscles where you need it. Um, and obviously that will then block things to the heart, to the brain. You get oxygen starvation in the brain, which is why you fall unconscious and eventually you stop breathing. So so it's not very nice, guy. And this is why when you have any type of, say, a boiler or especially if a boiler's in a room or in the house where people are, you've got to have a carbon monoxide alarm near it because you can't smell this stuff. Um, and you might think you just feel unwell, but actually you could be being poisoned by carbon monoxide. Okay, so let's look at some hydrated metal aqua complexes. Okay, now we've looked at some of these already in that table before. But metal aqua complexes are formed when we add a transition metal compound to water. So here we go. So we've got copper here, and we've got copper with um, with your water, with water surrounding it, with your water ligands here. Okay. So generally, six water molecules um, from... Uh, form a coordinate bonds with the metal ion. So that's generally what happens here. So a lone pair on the oxygen allows the bond to be formed. And that's basically how these how these work when and this happens when we dissolve any form of uh, transition metal in water, they form these big hexa aqua complexes here. And so these complexes are also written as CUH206 or CUH2063+. So these are two examples. These are uh, or Fe, sorry. So these are two examples of hexa aqua complexes. This is what happens with all transition metals. Okay, so transition metals take part in redox reactions as well. And so they have variable oxidation states as they can gain and lose electrons during a redox reaction. So remember what we said was one of the um, features of a transition metal is that they um, undergo, they have variable oxidation states. So what you don't need to do is you don't need to remember all of these equations that I'm going to put up on here. However, you are expected to form full equations from the information that they give you, i.e. half equations. So we're going to look at one example here. So this is an interconversion between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus reactions. So we can see here, here's two half equations. So we've got manganate and we've got Fe2 plus. So what we need to be able to do is form um, a, a full ionic equation from this. 
So what we need to do is multiply that bottom one by five. Now this is very similar to, in fact, this is the same as um, simultaneous equations if you do this in math. So we need to multiply that bottom one by five because we need to make sure that our electrons are the same in each equation. So we multiply everything here by five and then cancel out your electrons. And what we form is an overall ionic equation with no electrons at all. So we combine everything on the left-hand side in both of these equations and everything on the right hand side. So here we can see that manganese is being reduced and iron is being oxidized. And we know that because we're going from uh, manganese here, which is MnO4 minus in, in this one here, and it's going to Mn2 plus. And we can see that the iron's being oxidized because we're going from two plus to three plus here. Okay, so we've got a color change here and it goes from the green Fe2 plus and it goes to yellow Fe3+. So here's another example. This is iodide ions, so two iodide ions, and this forms iodine and two electrons, and we've got Fe3+, and Fe, forming Fe2+. So we're just going the other way here. So you can see we need to multiply this one by two to get the same number of electrons. We cancel them out, and we get our overall equation, which is shown there. And here what you can see is iron is being reduced and iodine is being oxidized. And we can see that it's being oxidized because it's going from an oxidation state of minus one to zero. So the oxidation number is increasing. And here we're going to from an oxidation state of plus three to plus two. So that means it's reducing. So that's being reduced. And we get a color change of yellow to green. So we're going the opposite way. So another example is the interconversion between Cr3 plus and Cr2O7 2 minus. So we can see here, here's an example of where we can use um, your Cr3 plus, um, which is this example here. So that should say, um, so this is just Cr3 plus. It's formed part of a complex. Uh, and then um, we've got hydrogen peroxide here. So again, we need to multiply that top one by three this time, because we've got to, balance, we've got to uh, make sure we've got the same number of electrons at either, either side. And then we form an overall ionic equation, which is the one at the bottom there. And here, what we can see is oxygen is actually being reduced and chromium is being oxidized um, in this reaction here. Um, and we get a color change, uh, which is dark green. That's the Cr3 plus um, going to yellow, which is the CrO42 minus. And if we add dilute, dilute sulfuric acid to the um, chromate 6 solution, that's CrO42 minus, and we produce an orange dichromate solution. So we need to be aware that um, you know, when we're uh, interchanging chromium, we're going from Cr3 plus to Cr207, we can actually also add an acid to this and we produce an orange solution instead. So we're going from 2CrO42 minus to form Cr207. This is your dichromate solution. Um, so we're going from uh, producing an orange uh, an orange solution um, here. Okay. And another one, again, continuing on with the chromium, chromium one, um, we can go from Cr2O7 to form chromium 3 plus using zinc. We multiply that top one by three uh, and we form obviously a dichromate here, which is Cr2O7 to form Cr3 plus. Um, and here the chromium has been reduced and the zinc has been oxidized. So we need to be able to make comments on them. And we do get a color change going from orange to green and all of this is in acidic conditions. So you need to be able to comment. Like I say, you don't need to remember the equations, but you do need to be able to comment. You do need to be able to balance the half equations, write your full ionic equation and comment on what's been oxidized and reduced and the color changes that's happening as well. And so the, the next one is copper two plus and copper. Again, you don't need to know the equations, uh, the equations for these, but there's the combined ionic equation. So, but we do need to know what's been reduced and oxidized. So your copper two plus here is being reduced because we're going from uh, copper two plus to copper one plus, which is here. Uh, and the iodide ions are being oxidized because they're going from minus one to zero. And we get a color change, it's pale blue from the copper two plus, and that forms an off-white precipitate of copper iodide, which is CUI. Um, and here's another example, this is going backwards. So this is going from copper plus to copper two plus uh, and here the, the copper plus 
um, has been simultaneously reduced and oxidized and we call this a disproportionation reaction so we're going effectively we're going um, backwards from Cu plus to Cu2 plus but we are also forming copper solid as well um, so what that means is that we are forming um, copper 1 plus has been reduced to copper but it's also been oxidized to copper 2 plus now your Cu plus is unstable so this reaction is very quick it's a spontaneous reaction and so the color change we go from a colorless um, Cu plus and that forms a pale blue copper 2 plus uh, and a copper precipitate as well so we're forming two things in that reaction okay so let's look at some of these test tube reactions again you do need to know the colors for these um, and we can identify transition metals by simply adding sodium hydroxide solution. This is no different to that table that you've seen before, which just summarizes um, the reactions that you were going to see. So if we add sodium hydroxide, what we could do is observe the color of the precipitate that's formed. So copper 2 plus, if we add sodium hydroxide and it goes pale blue and we form a pale blue precipitate, then that means that um, we have copper 2 plus. If we see a green precipitate, it means we've got Fe2+. If we have an orange-yellow precipitate, we have Fe3+. And if we have a pink precipitate, it means we've got manganese in there, so Mn2+. And if we've got a dirty green precipitate, it means we've got a chromium-3 plus iron in our, in our um, substance. So these are really important. You need to know the colors of these, and you need to know, um, you know how we test for transition metal ions. Okay, so let's look at other tests. So these are halide ions with silver nitrate. So we can test for halide ions using a transition metal, um, which is, um, for example, silver, so we use silver nitrate, and we can confirm this with ammonia solution as well. So these are some of your uh, chemical tests for substances. So for example, test for chloride, bromide, and iodide, all it involves is just adding nitric acid, then silver nitrate solution, and the color of the precipitate will help us to identify what type of halide ion we actually have in our in our uh, test tube. So you can see I've got a picture of, of one here which shows it. And you might have done this in the lab at school or college. But for chloride ions, what we see is a white precipitate forming. And basically this is silver ion reacting with chloride ions. And this will form silver chloride. Okay, And it's a white precipitate. So that precipitate that you see is silver chloride. Bromide ions, they form a cream precipitate, and the cream precipitate is silver bromide. And um, the uh, iodide ions forms a yellow precipitate, and this is silver iodide, as you can see the reactions there. So we add nitric acid, because you can see, notice that one of the things that we said, you had to add nitric acid. But we add nitric acid to react with any anions other than halides. So you might have some carbonate impurities floating around in your, in your solution. So... Um, what we want to do is we don't want to add silver uh, silver nitrate because that could react with some of them impurities and give you a false result. So what we do is we react with nitric acid, which reacts with any impurities in there. Um, and it means that the if you are forming a precipitate, you know it's because of a halide ion and not because of any other impurity. And we can test these because you might find, I mean, these have got a white background behind them, but it's really difficult to distinguish between them because the, the color changes are subtle. So what we can do is you can do a further test and we just add ammonia solution to the precipitates. So we form Cl minus. Um, uh, to add Cl minus, we get a white precipitate dissolves um, in dilute ammonia. So if we add dilute ammonia to, um, to the chloride one, it will dissolve. If we add dilute ammonia to any of the other ones, it won't. Um, bromide ions, we get a, the cream precipitate dissolves only in concentrated ammonia. So the bromide one, uh, silver bromide, will dissolve in concentrated ammonia only. Um, but the iodide ions is insoluble. It won't dissolve in either dilute or concentrated ammonia. Um, and fluoride ions, just to, just to make this really clear, fluoride ions do not form a precipitate. Silver fluoride... Uh, when you it does react with the silver nitrate but it forms silver fluoride which is soluble so we don't get a precipitate at all with fluoride ions so just be just be careful with that one okay so let's look at some other tests for ions as well um so test for carbonates um, and sulfates what we can use is hydrochloric acid and barium chloride to test for these so how do we test for carbonate so if we've made a solution and we're not sure if it contains a carbonate then what we do is we simply add um 
uh, we add an, uh, an acid to it. There we are. So we add hydrochloric acid, and that will react with any carbonates if they exist, um, and hydrogen carbonates. And what you'll produce is carbon dioxide gas. So if you've got a carbonate present, then you will see fizzing, and you'll see carbon dioxide produced. And to test to see if it is actually carbon dioxide, you bubble that through lime water, and it should turn cloudy. Um, testing for sulfates. So if you want to know if there's any sulfates in your um, in your sample, then we do a, a two-step process. So all we do is we add hydrochloric acid to remove any carbonates first. So we add that first because um, this could precipitate out if we if we do that. Um, and then what we do is we add barium chloride to our sample. Now, if there is a sulfate present, what we'll observe is a white precipitate. Um, because we're forming barium sulfate and barium sulfate is insoluble so if we do have um, if we do have uh, a sulfate uh, in our sample then we add barium chloride if we get a white precipitate that confirms we do have barium sulfate but just bear in mind we have to add HCl first to remove any other impurities that could give us a false test okay so let's test for ammonium compounds and hydroxides so we test for these and um, we test for ammonium compounds very simple all we add is we add sodium hydroxide we gently heat it and if ammonium compound is present then what we'll get is ammonia gas that's produced and ammonia gas is this pungent smell and um, it's very distinctive so you'll know if you've got ammonia in there um, and basically what we'll do is um, obviously you don't want to breathe a lot of this stuff in but um, another way is you just put litmus paper on the end so it's damp red litmus paper this will turn blue if you do have ammonia gas emerging from your test tube okay um, and just the um, this will be the same as well because when we looked at testing for ammonium compounds and hydroxides hydroxides is um, is is the same we just use litmus paper to test for hydroxide and obviously if that is um, turning uh, blue from a red litmus damp red litmus paper then um, obviously that could be a sign that we have a hydroxide um, because it's alkaline as well okay and that's it so that's the end of the video on transition elements and qualitative analysis so that's using test tube reactions as you've seen right at the end there and um, please subscribe to the channel there's loads more videos for OCRA um, right across the board so please have a look have a, a good look around and see uh, see what you can find there's a full range of videos for OCR uh, and other UK major examples as well, but please subscribe. They're all for free. Um, like I say, if you want to purchase um, these slides um, for for your own use, um, then you can just click in the link in the in the comments box below. Um, but um, that's it. Okay, bye bye.